we've been talking a lot about all kinds of things uh, in the Parkinson's world. And I think one of the things that we've realized is that we do, I think, a pretty good job of studying um, largely Caucasian males uh, in the age group of 60 in Parkinson's studies. And, um, and outside of that, we aren't really doing a lot of um, meeting of everyone's needs out there. I think we've been really identifying a lot of gaps in care and um, realizing that a number of, uh, of groups of patients out there that really don't have much of a voice in terms of um, research or advocacy. And so I think we're trying to change some of that this year on the, on the series and um, wanted to bring uh, an exciting group to you today. Um, uh, Sharon Krischer is actually my own patient. Um, I've known Sharon for a number of years. We won't get into her specifics of, of medical care, but um, she's a, a lovely woman, a grandmother, and uh, um, you know, a, a, a real um, innovator. So she has uh, started um, as part of, I think, some of her wellness um, and self-care, some um, great uh, strategies. She's very involved in exercise and yoga, but also has put together this amazing group of women um, that has really grown, I think, through the pandemic um, and is a women's support group. And so uh, she also has been blogging a lot and you can read her blogs on, uh, I think it's, I, th I know it's Twitchy Woman, but I can't remember exactly. She'll tell us in a minute about exactly where to find her offerings. And, um, and then we'll learn about some of the novel kind of ways that she's connecting other women. So Sharon, um, love to hear a little bit about sort of what inspired you to start blogging, first of all, and then start the um, women's support group. There you I'm go. Muted. Okay. Good afternoon. It's so nice to see all of you today. Um, I, there are a number of familiar names. I know a number of you come join me on Sunday mornings, and I'm so glad you came again today. Um, I was diagnosed about 12 years ago, and as Indy said, I've been her patient most of that time. I had started with a neurologist who gave me no information, et cetera, et cetera. And I basically lived in, a, in a denial for about five years. It really took me a long time. And then a psychologist who, who I was seeing at UCLA in their movement disorders uh, program suggested that I write my narrative. And I said, I don't write. He said, just write, you know. So I started writing and I couldn't stop. And 5,000 words later, I gave it to him. He, nobody's ever seen it except him. And, um, but what happened was during that, the last couple of years, people started calling me. I had not gone public. I did not tell anybody that I, outside of my family that I had Parkinson's. And people were calling me. Can you talk to this person? Can you talk to that person? They were just diagnosed. So not too long after uh, Dr. Johnson asked me to write this, I thought maybe I'll write, start a blog and just write some of these things out so I don't have to sit down and have coffee with every, every person who calls me. You know, it's like, here's all the information I have. And um, it's been going for six years now. Next month will be six years. And um, anyway, I, a year later, I applied to a program from the uh, then Parkinson's Disease Foundation called Parkinson's, Women in Parkinson's Initiative. And I went to that and we were told to go home and do something in our community. So I started a women's group that we called a non-support support group. So we basically had activities. We did boxing, we did yoga, we did arts and crafts, we did all kinds of things. And this continued on and off for about four years and then the pandemic hit. And we, everything got shut down. And I thought, what if I take my little group, my group on Zoom, I had about a hundred names. Let's just, I'll email these people. I'll see if I can schedule something. And I scheduled our first meeting on Zoom on March 22nd. And looking back, my blog also started on March 22nd, five years prior to that, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I did this because it was clear that we were gonna be stuck at home. We didn't know how long but it was a way to get people out, uh, out and talking to each other because our exercise classes were shut down. Our, our uh, support groups were shut down. We couldn't get together. So Zoom is a great way to get together and bring people out of their isolation. So I said, okay, we'll do this every two weeks for about three months and then cut it back to once a month. Well, when things get better, if they didn't get better, we're still every, every two weeks. And last week I suggested maybe cutting back to once a month and you should have seen the reaction of these women. They don't wanna give it up, they love it. They said, we wanna keep getting together, don't stop. 
so um, obviously we're meeting a need for women to get together. And, and the interesting thing that happened last summer, sometime over the summer, they started talking to each other during the sessions, which was amazing, you know? And we had people coming from England and from Germany and Sweden and all over the place. And uh, one, when I first started this thing, the goal was just to reach out to my LA women. And a woman from New Jersey, who I see is on the call today, emailed me and said, well, can I join your group? And I'm like, sure, why not? And then, you know, now we've got almost 400 women from around the world who are connecting with each other online. It is, has been amazing. And uh, in the foreseeable future, we'll keep meeting every other week if I can keep it up. Um, or beg and borrow, some, beg people to take my place occasionally. And, you know, th somebody else's turn to shine in the spotlight. Um, but one of the really interesting things that happened was because there was nowhere, nowhere that people could meet other people with Parkinson's in person to talk to them. We missed that connection, you know, where if you, you were newly diagnosed and you went to a boxing class, you met other people you could talk to who understood you, that was gone. So we started talking about a mentoring program. And last summer, I asked my women online who were probably about 150 at that time and said, is any interested in doing this? And I ended up with a team of then 10 and now we have 19 women who have put this whole program together, which we will talk about. Uh, we, we rolled it out in November and that has been amazing. That's so cool. Well, I think, yeah. and as, as sort of watching from, you know, the doctor's seat or whatever the seat is, and now I'm on a, in my chair from my living room on Zoom, um, you know, we have our visits. I think that, you know, my sense of just the transformation of somebody who is in denial and then going into sort of owning a disease and then sort of giving back to the community and kind of the advocacy, I, I think is really energetically kind of cool to watch and in, in people and you're, you know, certainly embody that and other, other patients of mine. And I've seen it happen in be, be, before my eyes. And it's kind of a beautiful thing to sort of see, um, because I think maybe you could speak to that sort of, um, transition between, uh, the, denial and then the sort of owning and then the advocacy piece. What has that done for you? And kind of, how do you think that kind of, where did, where, where did that come from? Oh God. Uh, you know, I was, when I started blogging and I was posting things and one day I posted my blog on my regular Facebook group instead of Facebook page, instead of my Facebook group for twitchy woman and the world didn't come crashing down. And it was like, oh, okay, I guess I, I'm, and people were coming up to me anyway saying, you know, you really, we're worried about you, what's going on? So it was time to come out of, come out of uh, hiding. It, but it took five years for me to go to anything. The first thing I went to was the Fox Foundation event in Pasadena. God, six or seven years, it had to be seven years ago, something like that. And um, that was the first time I did anything uh, related to Parkinson's. And it was like, once I got involved in the Parkinson's community, I couldn't stop. And I find that a lot of the women I talk to are feeling the same way if they're involved. It's like it create the community itself creates an energy that just sucks us in. That's awesome. And what about um, the blogging? What does that do for you? Do you think there's a therapy that you get from writing? Where is that right now? Yeah, you know, I never considered myself a writer. Um, never, in fact, my husband, my husband and his friends all said when he was in law school, they, you know, we'd be in discussions. They said, why don't you apply to law school? I said, I hate writing. So I didn't become a lawyer. Uh, and I didn't write literally until in my sixties. And I found, you know, they say that you find new creativity through Parkinson's. This is my new creativity because I did artwork before I haven't picked up a paintbrush in years, but I'm writing. So go figure. That's awesome. Well, maybe you guys could tell us a little bit about the mentorship program and kind of where you found what, where, what need did you see and how have you filled that? Um, and I think, you know, one of the things I, I know we were just talking about how we don't want this just to be about 
only women and, and exclude men. I think we can use it as a model for, you know, how people can connect with each other. You know, some people might think, you know, you think about young onset Parkinson's patients or people of color with Parkinson's or different communities, they may find um, like threads that could help kind of bind them in some way and, and help them kind of develop an idea similar. Um, and so maybe you could kind of just speak generally about mentorship and, and kind of the, the sort of concept of that. Um, I'm going to let Susan talk a little bit because she's been very involved in produ pr putting this whole program together. Yeah. So, Andrea, can we have that happen? Susan, go ahead. Welcome, everyone. Um, I uh, was, you asked a question about how you start doing it. And when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, we knew a year before, but the official diagnosis three years ago, I was given a notebook from the University of Pennsylvania where in Penn and where I go, that was supposed to be filled with all this information and the notebook was empty, which was, was a big scandal at Penn and a whole big thing. But uh, that's when I cried. That's when I cried because I came home, I was dealing with this possible diagnosis for a year. I knew I had the LARC2 gene, just a lot of things. But when you're told it still hits you like a brick in the face, but uh, when I opened the notebook and it was accidentally by pen empty, I broke into tears because I just felt there was, that's metaphorical, you know? And then when I started talking to Penn about a mentor program, which is over two years ago now, two and a half years ago, it was because I knew what I was missing. I knew what I needed and I didn't have. So uh, I'm still working with Penn, Jenny Campbell's on there, who's my partner in crime for Penn. Um, and it's moving forward. It's moving forward in a much more bureaucratic way in a way that can be uh, um, a, a medical university um, a center of excellence can repeat and be a model. So we're doing a study and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I came to wanting to do a mentor program. When I heard about Sharon, it was because people knew I was setting this up at Penn and I was asked to reach out to Sharon. And of course, Sharon so graciously let me know what was going on and let me uh, sort of, since I was, I gotta move, sorry, you know the feeling. Uh, since I'd already done all this work with Penn and all the research and everything, she let me sort of guide a lot of the production of this thing. But with Sharon, since we're not connected to anything but women who have a lot of guts and we build things, it's been off the ground now since November. And um, I've found we have different kinds of mentees that we do. Uh, people who are recently diagnosed have very different needs and people who are just settling into the diagnosis. I think Sharon, can, uh, Sharon B can speak to that. And I... Um, and for me, it's been like um, Sharon Kay wrote her, her blog. I wrote a piece on Parkinson's and, and I have been a writer of like professionally and I didn't need to show it to anybody. I have shown it to people, but since it was for me to settle up and own what was going through called Sisyphus in the golden year, like the first year of Parkinson's. And it's been a way of sorting out everything and feelings and what you go through and what your, how your life has changed. And, but being that I've been in um, theater and film all my life until I retired a couple of years ago from being a professor, I felt I still had more things I wanted to do and give. So I just switched my energies, sort of like Sharon said, into the Parkinson's community. And I've been very involved as an activist and with the with the mentor groups and other ways and a lot of studies in the Parkinson's community. Um, what I get is a sense of that I'm taking the lemon of my disease and making a little lemonade out of it. So I have more sense of self-worth, which Parkinson's can really strip you of, of who you are in the world and who you thought you would be. And there's no cure and there's no anything but down this as I wrote, you're standing against a gale wind, hoping not to walk backwards too quickly. And, um, but 
the women that I've mentored, and it's very interesting because I have, you know, men have approached me too, and I have some outside people who have contacted me, and that's a whole other thing, and I mentor in the same way, but it's so interesting that women, all the problems I've been in touch with have been women, have been women who say, okay, we've built this family, or we've built this career, or we've built whatever, and now we're ready to build something else out of our lives, and uh, the mentees have graced my life in a myriad of ways, even ones that only want one phone conversation, because that sometimes happens too. Um, I don't, you know, I sort of like, um, I don't mean to ramble, but the one thing I did notice about the mentor program that I talked to in our last mentor meeting was the um, percentage of people who are newly diagnosed that just need one long phone call and then they don't want any more. And they may come back, but they don't want any more. And the women who seem to want the mentoring uh, didn't take them five years like Sharon, or but I uh, but um, have settled into this diagnosis a couple of years into their life and now really want to have their life have more focus, including Parkinson's and not just dealing with Parkinson's. And um, Sharon is, Sharon B has been one of my favorites. Um, but do you have, Indu, do you have questions? Yeah, yeah. so um, you mentioned a few things. So one, a few of the things that you have resonated so far with women talking about with other women is kind of fun is, um, you know, the, the women, like the guts that you all have is, is a statement that I think is cute. And then, yeah. you know, this energy that I think is sort of pervaded the conversation between, you know, Sharon and I and, and, and you and I so far, um, you know, so I think this sort of energetic sort of stuff, there's sort of this, you know, the, the sort of um, power that I think women have in groups maybe is, is sort of a cool way to think about it. And, and sort of the, the sort of way that we've historically connected with each other sometimes um, where only, I guess, other women can understand certain things that women are going through. And it's not to exclude men, but it's sort of a way to bring, you know, a group of women together. And um, so I, I think that's fascinating. I, I just love the language that some of you, you guys are using and I, I have it hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, so when you talk about the research that you're doing, and I know I, I work in an institution and, you know, I think that the choice to not do it within the UCLA or, or other, um, you know, institutional walls is, is, is probably smart because you can kind of do what you want and get get it somewhere but you know I think uh, I think having the study along with is, is also helpful to have a, a way to measure things and what worked and didn't work but you you mentioned the research that had gone into kind of creating it did you model it against um, a different sort of disease state or a different sort of mentorship program how did you kind of come up with what you're doing well the research I did I spoke to uh, the people who a lot of people who run the man-to-man -man program with prostate cancer and I spoke to several breast cancer groups that a lot of, there's a lot of mentorship groups out there, but the one thing about some of the groups, cancer groups is hopefully they're, they don't need the group anymore because they have uh, enough remission that they call themselves cured. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, um, but there are chronic illnesses that, and metastatic breast cancer. And I've talked, I started talking to the people in those groups mentioned Jenny Campbell again, who's a social worker or a professor of social work, who gave me, you know, like stacks of material she thought I was going to glance through, but I actually read, which was really boring, but <laughs> we could, but certain programs, it, it was a lot of it, you know, and everything I looked at, it was a lot of it was just common sense. Somebody with an armed with a certain amount of knowledge about Parkinson's and has centered the Parkinson's, come to terms with their own Parkinson's, usually after a couple of years, gets to uh, help somebody else come to terms with their Parkinson's. And what, there's a difference when you have a chronic illness versus when you have a, a serious illness that can be cured. And the, the, the choices you can make, the way you deal with your doctors, the way you deal with your family, and trying to empower the next person to be able to incorporate Parkinson's in their life the best for their life. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, but most of the programs ran pretty much the same way. A couple of them, you know, limit you have three contacts and this and that, and Penn's not gonna work that way at all. Penn's gonna work pretty much the way we're working at Twitchy Women. But, um, but they, yes, when they're with a big bureaucratic organization, 
the nice thing about the pen thing, and I'm really happy to be with Twitchy Women because it is more, hey, look, women know how to talk to other women, just get on the phone or get on a Zoom. But um, they hope to build a model that can go to other, uh, yep. like UCLA and other uh, centers of excellence and say, this is what we did and this is how we did it. And you yeah. can. Yeah. And it's also, because well, with Sharon, ahead. I talked to a woman in England today with Penn, it'll just be Penn patients. Okay. Sharon, did you have something to say? Yeah, uh, you know, because we're grassroots, you know, we, we don't have visions of becoming some huge organization, at least not at this point. I don't know how we're gonna handle it if we do. But um, the first thing we did was, we, you know, the one rule that we have is that we do not give medical advice, period, end of discussion. And if the mentee starts asking for medical advice, we have to say to them, you need to speak to your doctor about it. That's, that's really the only rule that we have um, but the real, real purpose of this, and I heard a lot of this in Kyoto at the World Parkinson's Congress talking to other bloggers, there was a lot of talk about the need for a mentee program, a peer on peer, peer to peer program. And this was what we were hearing, talking about in the halls. It was not in any of, any of the um, sessions that I remember. And, um, you know, I came home and talked to a few people about it. There was one, another woman in LA who had, had, we had been talking about it and we floated the idea and it just didn't go anywhere. And then last summer with the pandemic, it, it was like the perfect time to do this because people were, women were coming out of the woodwork, literally. I have gotten emails from women. I was diagnosed an hour ago and I found you. I need help. Nobody, you know, my doctor gave me no information. Where do I turn? And yeah. that's why we, that's why we started this because there was nowhere to turn. Uh, Sharon, right? I mean, Sharon obviously is right about the medical, but we sometimes help validate somebody calling a doctor or contacting their doctor. In other words, us saying this is a medical issue, you deserve to call your doctor. You deserve yeah. to have a team of people around you that will help you through this. This is not just a. Most doctors in India, you understand this. You know, you get diagnosed, they ask, they tell you to take medication and they see you in six months. Sometimes they'll tell you to exercise. They don't really explain the power of exercise. They don't tell you have choices about medication. And um, the other thing that Sharon did, and I don't know who gave them to you, Sharon, but they've been incredibly helpful. Is she, uh, somebody brought in handouts of what to say, you know, if somebody's asked a question and, and all the mentors seem to have, you know, read them and use them as a guide. Pen, one of the things that they're doing, and we're about to launch it, the training in about a month, is um, the head social worker there and other couple of other people are putting together a training program. And they mm -hmm. called uh, Jenny and, and another person, Tom Quigley, we're not just women at Penn, and me. And we put together things that we felt were really strong that the mentors should be aware of in their mentor program. Sure. Um, but, you know, I love Sharon's. The first one is what to say instead of saying, how are you? Okay. That's cute. Yeah, I found those from another organization that I'm, I think it's, um, I, I write for another online Parkinson's organization. You know, it's just, a, uh, they have a website and they, you know, I submit articles. And from time to time, they send us things, you know, just yeah. hints about how to say things. Yeah. And, or, you know, responding to articles. And I think that's where that came from, but they were invaluable. Great. Well, maybe you can share anything you'd be willing to share. I'm sure that Andrea would be happy to link as well. Cause I think we want to model this so that it, you know, can resonate throughout the world and, you know, find its own home wherever, you know, you, and it might be the 10 people that you find to talk about or five people or just appear. So I think, you know, it would be great to kind of have this um, be duplicated and learn from it. And I think, you know, yeah. as physicians and as the medical community and even, you know, research community, I think we're realizing that we don't have all the right answers and that, you know, a, a visit, you know, for 15 or 30 minutes, we have the luxury of 30 minute follow-up at UCLA, but you know, most people get 15 minutes with, um, with their provider. If it's six, every six months, that's lucky. Sometimes it's a year in some countries, mm -hmm. you know, with the movement disorder specialist, you really can't address 99% of the things in that visit. So, you know, you're going through the medications and trying to figure out what to be renewed and then the visit's over. So I think, you know, other strategies, meeting people where they are with the needs that they have and, and utilizing, you know, the community 
um, at these grassroots levels is I think absolutely very, very, very helpful. And also the time point. So you mentioned, I, I think we've had some chat that's around even other things like palliative care medicine, other sorts of you know ways to support people. And I think it it, it has to be customized to the person involved. So some people are going to just want you know one time you know here's the diagnosis and and here's what you have you know in store for you possibly. But then other people may kind of choose to kind of come out of the woodwork when they when and as they need it. It might you know weekly or um, you know uh, monthly sessions are too much. And then other people maybe you know you become like an extended family member who they check in with you know on a pretty regular Right. Basis. And I think you all know that I have been spending the last year thinking about loneliness um, just in general and its effects on health. And so I think this is, you know, a form of social prescribing um, at its best. So we're, you know, having people kind of connecting with each other to sort of literally give each other social support. So I think if there's a way to connect this sort of thing from, you know, as a doctor to hand it off, I think, I think, um, you know, it, it sounds like the best of all worlds. Do you guys have a way to match people with um, their, uh, yeah. Or a mentee. And I'd love to hear from Sharon, the mentee as well in, in a moment. Okay. Um, we started out with an application for men mentees, just asking some basic information, you know, how old were they when they were diagnosed? Um, how many years ago were they diagnosed? And it, what's funny is, you know, the bottom is just tell, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. We'd like to know if they worked, what they've done, you know, their interests. And I'd say half of them don't, don't even bother to fill that out. They just give us their name and contact information and that's it. And I will email them back and they'll go, oh. <laughs> and then they'll pour out their whole life story. Some, sometimes, sometimes you don't get anything. Um, but we had enough people on our team or if that we, you know, that we could just kind of, and I knew most of these people on, on our team. I knew the people on our team. So I was just kind of matching them by where they lived, if they were close enough, because if they lived nearby or, lived, or, or if they were young onset, whatever it may be, it was just kind of a feeling how to do it. And then we got a request from somebody in Sweden. And we don't know how the Swedish healthcare system works. We don't know what their resources are. And then I started thinking and I sat on a panel with a woman from the Netherlands last year uh, for another, you know, on another uh, Zoom thing for another Zoom meeting. So I emailed her and I said, would you be interested in talking to this person? And she did. And they've had a wonderful relationship because of it. And the same thing happened. We got a call, an email from somebody from England, from London. And we have a woman who comes every, every one of our meetings on Sundays. She wouldn't miss it for anything. And I emailed her and I said, would you be interested? And she said, sure, I'd love to talk to her. So you never know where you're going to find the right person. I've been lucky because I have made relationships with women all over the place, but now it's getting to the point where I can't do it by myself. So we, uh, Susan and another woman on our team came up with a very detailed application form for mentors. And we, we, it was, it went live this morning and it's on the website. And if you want to be a mentor, uh, fill it out and they will talk to you and they, they will make the determination whether or not, you know, this person should be part of the program. The most interesting thing that happened though, we had one woman from Texas who had contacted us, one of the first women who, who was looking for a mentor and we assigned somebody, they had a conversation and then her mentor had went and moved into uh, assisted living and said, I can't do this anymore. So I contacted the mentee. I said, do you want somebody else? She said, you know, I spoke to her for an hour and she helped me so much. I want to help somebody else. So now she's on our team and she's going to be assigned one meeting. And she said, I'm ready. So we're paying it forward. Yeah, um, Sharon's a little modest. She says, I don't know how big it's going to get. It's getting quite big. I interviewed uh, the woman, Christy and I, who are taking over the mentor interviews. Um, we're, we're doing a Zoom with them because they're form is fine, but we want to make sure they're fine to mentor and, and whatever. We want to see, make sure they have enough sort of Parkinson's 101, have enough knowledge where they say, they don't have to say, I don't know, I don't know. And also stress, no, no medical advice, no medical advice. But uh, no, uh, Sharon's program is going to really, um, no pun intended, Zoom very quickly now. <laughs> so we're trying to gear up with a lot of mentors now because uh, the woman in England today was great, Sharon. We love her. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> oh, good, good. Awesome. Oh, I'm so glad. 
Well, I think this is great. And I think, you know, what some of the research shows when somebody volunteers or when there's mentorship or these sort of connections is that both people get a lot from, you know, for their mental health and for their, you know, wellness um, from these relationships. So even though it seems like, you know, there's one person receiving more, um, you know, one person giving more of the, it's sort of very mutual. And I think that that sort of purpose and the repurposing sort of the shift and, and pivoting into a different purpose that some of you have described, um, you know, of, of sort of being these, uh, you know, moms and grandmothers and all these sort of different roles that you've had, and then, you know, sort of getting to this place and then thinking about how to, um, you know, shift that energy and, and help uh, somebody else can really, I think, make a big difference in your own sort of um, uh, well-being. And so we definitely urge that. And so I think there's a lot of comments here, but let's, before we go to the comments, um, I'd love to hear from Sharon B, the mentee, about sort of what, what had, what was the reason that you thought you would be, um, you know, needing a mentor? Um, and, uh, and then what have you kind of gotten from it? And I know your mentor is on here, so it's a bit awkward, but, you know, try to be as honest as you can. <laughs> so I think I'm a little bit like Sharon Kay in that I was diagnosed about two years ago and I wasn't in denial, but I just was like overwhelmed. I was fatigued. Um, I was working full time. I'm, I'm a palliative care chaplain in a hospital. And I was, you know, just to like find another thing was just too much for me. And then actually I found Sharon's Twitchy Woman Sunday mornings and I started to watch them, not in real time, but watch them later. And I was like, oh, there's people like me. And I saw the faces and it, and it felt really good. And I, and then said, I just sent a thank you to Sharon saying, this was so great. If I have to tell you, I just loved it. And she said, well, do you want a mentor? And I was like, oh, okay. And what's been great about it is that um, being able to talk to somebody um, that you've got the shorthand language, she knows and gets what you're talking about. When we were talking about women helping women, I think last November, my family was all going to be there for Thanksgiving. And I was terribly anxious about not providing, you know, the big Thanksgiving. And I have daughters that love to cook. I mean, I, I, it's not like I had to do anything but sort of the loss of that role. And I could just sort of say, I'm really sad today. And Susan was like, yeah, yeah. You know, and she could, she could feel what I was feeling through Zoom or on the phone. Um, that felt really good. And the other piece was that sometimes when you talk to people about what's going on, you sometimes feel like they're placating you. But I, this might sound strange, but one time I was just woke up in the morning, I was just sad and crying and I, texted Susan said, a terrible day and I don't know whether I'm supposed to exercise or nap or what I'm supposed to do. Does it get any better? And she emailed me back and she said, no, not really. Um, but go take a walk and it, things will get calmer and you'll get stronger and it'll be okay. And it was just lovely that it was just, um, it just felt so natural between us um, and so comfortable. Um, and she encourages me to think through some of my palliative care paradigms and connect those. And, you know, we just have a really nice time. And she checks in on me too. She hadn't heard from me in a while. She said, you don't need to email me back, but just want to see how you're doing. And I'd been thinking about emailing her and I hadn't, and I was tired and I was like, that just felt so nice. <laughs> it just felt so nice. Yeah, um, so that's, that's it's been a great collaboration. And do you see yourself switching roles at some point then? Do you see yourself as the mentor at some point? Where's the handoff point if so? Um, I, I already told Susan actually asked me and I said, well, then you're not gonna be my best friend anymore. That's not fair. Not that we talk all that much, but, and she said, no, 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 you can still talk to me. And I said, sure, sure, I'm happy to. Um, because I think that's one of the things she's modeled for me is that it actually is a peer to peer mentorship it has not been, um, uh, I have the knowledge and I am imposing into you, um, but that peer-to-peer -peer comfortable relationship is what she's modeled for me that I would, no, I don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to journey with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a mentor is saying is I'm willing to journey with you. Right, right. Sort of hold your hand along the way, not be dragging you along or pushing you from behind. It's sort of, yeah. you're walking together. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that because I think, you know, the concept of a peer-to-peer -to, -peer to me seems like, you know, um, and, and, you know, we do mentorship even in, 
in other, you know, in academics or whatever, where you have somebody literally at your level um, and that gives you sort of advice, but they, they aren't exactly in your shoes, but they're kind of, but then there's, you know, other sort of mentors that maybe, you know, six years farther or at a totally different, you know, institution sometimes or whatever. And so people say that you sometimes need many types of mentors and, and different types of mentors at different sort of stages. So, so it is, it, it's interesting that you guys feel like you're sort of at the same sort of level. There's not this sort of hierarchy of, of knowledge. Um, um, one thing I want to say, um, we, at Penn, we discussed it like AA, like a sponsor still sometimes has their own sponsor, but they're further along the road, down the road of acceptance or diagnosis that they can help the next person up. But it, it's not that different. And I think our relationship, it's my mentorships are a little like AA. It's not like, uh, you know, I still want to talk to somebody too, but I'm further down the road of whatever than the mentees that I have. And, and I really feel that. And I think that actually is a way of empowering your mentee. You know what I mean? Is that, that Susan has been very free in sharing what she's feeling. It's not like, I'm holding back and I am the, the, the therapist for yeah. you. Yes. It, it feels like we're, we're kind of in this together. And she's like, yeah, I had a lousy day yesterday too. You know, and, it, and that feels very comfortable and, and makes me able to be more vulnerable. Yeah. So there's been a lot of things in the chat just about, um, you know, subpopulations. So I think everyone's really excited about the concept of this and, and one, you know, is, is just, you know, a lot of congratulatory sort of things in the chat about, you know, getting this off the ground. And in some ways, I guess it's a silver lining of the pandemic is that people are, you know, sort of physically stuck somewhere and so are, are able to have the time and energy to commit to this, you know, um, sort of the, the, first of all, the group, the support group, the, the non-support support group or whatever it was. Um, but then, you know, also the mentorship sort of, I think people are probably, you know, not traveling the world or, you know, doing as much as they normally would. And so, so maybe have a little bit more time to check in with each other. But um, there's also been some questions about, you know, subpopulation. So is there, you know, age? Um, so are there, do you guys know of more younger women support group stuff? Is that a, a subsection or is there like breakout rooms for, you know, let's say women under 40, maybe with Parkinson's. Um, there's also been some questions about, you know, is there um, people of women of color, uh, women of South Asian origin, um, you know, Indian origin, you know, so I, I think there's sort of a sense that I think people love this, but are wondering if there's even a, a, even more um, matching or, or possibilities for smaller subgroups. Do you guys have anything like that, Sharon? Well, not formally yet. We do have one woman who really wants to deal with young onset and, um, We've revised the form, mentee form as well, which I just posted. I, I, I had the mentor from, form posted twice under both the titles on this website, which will get fixed, but it's in the, the correct one is in the chat now. Um, so we do ask if, you, you know, if you're young onset, we don't ask ra ethnicity, race or anything like that. Um, and we have uh, a woman in Rome who actually grew up with Susan, correct? She's a friend of Susan's. In Trieste, yes. Uh huh. So she she's in Italy. Uh, we, you know, we're hoping to. We haven't paired her with anybody yet because we don't have anybody requesting from that area. Uh, like I said, the woman in Sweden. I went to somebody from the Netherlands because I didn't know anybody else closer. Uh, we're doing what we can, you know, uh, as far as uh, matching the people up the best way we can. So far. Most of the women are, well, age-wise, they're kind of all over the place. Um, the Is one that was she's talking about matching when she's saying areas, well, we talked about our time zones. So yeah. nobody's like five hours away time zone. I mean, we can do a couple hours and whatever, but we're trying to do time zones because, you know, if somebody wants to talk at seven o'clock their time, it could be 11 o'clock somebody else's time. So right. that's been important. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's also That's a question about women who speak other languages possibly too. So maybe, maybe I, th I don't think it's out, out of the question to put race and ethnicity there um, and possibly even other languages spoken. I think, you know, some people are asking about those things. So It wouldn't hurt. I guess we just, we never, we never thought about it, you know, because it just isn't an issue for us. Um, we have one mentor who is African-American and her mentee is, um, they're in the same industry, but she's dealing with a white woman, you know, a Caucasian woman, 
and they've become very close. So, yeah, sometimes when they tell know. us about themselves, we can get an idea. So there's a woman I had, uh, I have now who's New York based and we had enough commonality that we have more than Parkinson's and that's been sort of nice. I love her, I love her. And um, so sometimes professions have been helpful more than we've talked about no men. Yeah. <laughs> no man that's the main thing um no so and it sounds so there are, so the comments are saying you know that, that they love that sort of ideas to help um with matching you know then some of the tips that you talked about on that sheet about talking um there's also been um yeah so the sort of if you could put the the website one more time um andrea that would be great um there's yeah a language question, you know, if there could be other languages included. Um, and then, um, yes, people are excited to see younger women as well. Um, somebody who writes, I help co-lead a group, a support group for people with PD and their care partners called Shakers Anonymous. I like that name. We have over yeah. 350 people. So that's, um, Lynn has written that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, for just, yeah, I think the, the, the language is, is, is uh, again, been, um, been here. And I mean, I think, so I've been learning a little bit about color and race this year. I mean, I think, um, I actually in the last few years around meditation and people saying, why do we need yoga retreats for people of color? Like, why does that matter? I don't see color as an issue. Like it, everyone's the same color, but the truth is that, you know, people of color know that they have different, you know, backgrounds and different things that they live with. And so I think for me, I, I would put it in because I think that you know, I think it does help. Um, and if people are looking for somebody that is the same, you know, color as them or the same race or wh whatever, I think it would be reasonable to know that, right? So that people, you can meet people where they are again and, and sort of um, yeah. help them get guided. Um, so I know, yeah. I, I know not to break in, but I know I do support groups um, on grief and things. And then it's, it, it's, it's back to the shorthand language. You, you know what I mean? It's finding people. And that's why I, I found definitely with race and with ethnicity, um, sometimes in, in grief groups that I run, it's helpful that they can just sort of say, okay, we get that piece together. Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's unspoken. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. We just, it, you know what? When we were putting this whole thing together, nobody even thought about it, which yeah. is well, considering so what's going on in the outside world. Um, we, it we just thought, wasn't an issue for any of us. No, but it, we thought about it at Penn. The problem is you have to have the source of enough mentors to be able to do that kind of matching. We haven't had enough mentors of diversity reach out to us that we could even handle something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think as this grows and stuff like that. Um, so Gavin is on here. Gavin was excited to um, see this program because he's been doing his own peer to peer mentoring. And Naomi's also joined us, I guess. We can have Naomi talk about what you wanted her to talk about, Sharon. Uh, but Gavin says, women are naturally so much better than us with this, than men at this. In some sense, out of necessity, it's just interesting how much more receptive women to support and guidance are than than men are generally. So so maybe this is part of the nurturing ways that we are and and uh, who knows. But but I, I do maybe kind of a beautiful thing. My first my, my first Parkinson's friend was a man that I knew, um, and we belonged to the same synagogue. In fact, he I was president of the synagogue and he was president of the synagogue several years later. So we we had that common bond and and we were diagnosed about the same time, and. We were a support group of two for five years, literally. And um, it was fine. It, it was fine, you know, uh, but, you know, now he, and he calls me all the time with questions. I don't ask him anything because he, think, he thinks he doesn't know anything. But, uh, you know, as long as you have somebody there for you who has Parkinson's, it doesn't matter if what color they are, what gender they are, if it's somebody who can talk, you can talk to and ask questions as a per person with Parkinson's, that's the importance of this. Um, so I don't think it matters, you know, who they are as, as long as you get along. Yeah. And, but I understand Sharon and Indu's point. It's not that it, 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 it's just a smaller section of what matters. Right. What you know, it's a smaller section of what matters, basic the all overall Parkinson's, but it would be nice to be able to do that, but you have to have the pool of people to be able to do that with. Yeah, yeah. I think if people right. realize that this existed and they came out of wherever they are and, and some people I think of, they don't feel like they belong in some of these spaces. And so if they realize that they could belong and I think that the Zoom platform allows more people to come and be there without having to leave their homes sometimes and be, 
you know, um, in their skin in a different place. But I've, I've spent a lot of time understanding this in the last couple of years. And I, my mind has been pretty much blown at how, you know, much of this is, is something that I just took for granted, honestly, even through my medical school training. So, so really try to open my mind to some of this. So I wanted to let Naomi say something as well. Sharon, did you want to introduce Naomi? Um, yeah. Naomi, I met how long ago, five years ago, since we had a boxing program for our, our support, non-support group. And Naomi came, I know you were there because I have pictures of you. And uh, I get a call a few weeks later inviting me to come speak to a support group in Glendale. It's Naomi, this was Naomi's support group. And she told the person who was in charge you know, about me. And so I went and spoke and we've become very good friends as a result. We both went to the World Parkinson's Congress in Portland uh, with a third woman uh, who was also in that group. And we just hung out together and that was the beginning of a beautiful fr friendship, like they say in um, uh, Casablanca. But um, we, we've been friends ever since. So, uh, and Naomi has really done a lot of work in the Parkinson's community. And if you, anybody knows about the Crane Project, Naomi is the brainchild behind the Crane Project. And I'm gonna let her talk about how she's reached out to other women because she's, she's done an amazing job. Actually, she's reached out to a lot of people, not just women with Parkinson's through this project. Thank you. Hi, Naomi. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Andu. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was first diagnosed, I was still working and it was on my lunch break and I went in and you know, the doctor said, I'm just going to come out with it. You have Parkinson's. Here's a prescription, you know, and my husband and I left there and we're like, you know, how do you even spell Parkinson's? Not knowing really anything. And when I was working, I worked in the information systems area. So I've got like a technical background and I was doing something called change management. And when you find out something, you get into a funk and we used it to help people go from one system to another, but it's, it's for life. These are life things that hit you or hit others that you love. And I knew when I was at the bottom of this change curve in the funk area, I needed to get myself out. So how, how do you do that? You know, you, you start researching and there's a lot of junk out there on the internet that, you know, when I started reading some of the things that was like, Okay, put that aside. And I was in search of community, in search of something like this mentor program. So I know how I felt and I know from talking to others that when you find out something, it's so good for your well-being, for your just living well to reach out and have others that are like you, they, you know, I was looking for someone I would, I have two younger children, I was working, you know, how do you deal with dealing with kids? When do you tell the kids? When do you tell work? Do you not tell work? So all these different things and, and, you know, not having someone to understand exactly what you're going through is difficult. So when this program offers something where there's other people and if you're having a bad day, we get it. You know, there's, you don't even have to ask questions or explain. Or if you want to talk to someone who's been through, do you tell work or how, how, you know, share with us what you went through when you were working and when you told work or you told your kids, that's something that's very invaluable to have. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, well, I, I think the crane project was beautiful. Can you tell us um, a little bit about it? And I still wear the jean jacket that you uh, made, oh. <laughs> that I guess Clara made around that project. It's, it's super cute. I'm gonna um, turn my video off so you can see the picture because that's one of the umbrellas behind it. Oh yeah. Yeah. So with Parkinson's, your fine motor skills, like I had to have my daughter help me button my shirt. <laughs> You know, just like little things like that, that a lot of people don't even think about sometimes become a, a challenge. So 
my I had a couple of friends and we were folding origami cranes and I'm half Japanese. So I was telling them when I got married 30 something years ago that we did a thousand cranes and we had that for our wedding. I was telling them what that meant. It helps with the healing, health and hope. So as we were doing that and I was teaching them how to do the cranes and practicing our fine motor skills, I just blurted out this you know, thought like, wouldn't it be neat if we could do a thousand cranes for the World Parkinson Congress? Wouldn't it be neat if we did 10,000? And so it's just like this idea and we're just, you know, just hanging out together. And from that, I ended up being able to meet the executive director of the World Parkinson Congress. And with it being in Kyoto, she loved the idea. And we ended up touching a lot of people all around the world. We had over 16,000 handmade origami cranes, and many of them had messages of hope written on the wings. And then I, I felt like a mommy bird because when we were in Kyoto, you know, as a special gift, a lot of people were able to take one of these umbrellas home. We had over 30 umbrellas with 500 or more cranes strung and hung from each one. So a lot of work that went into this. And just when I, when I had to say bye, I felt like a mommy bird with all the little birdies leaving the nest. <laughs> they were leaving the nest to go soar around the world to just, you know, continue giving hope. How cute. That's lovely. Yeah, it was a very lovely idea. And I know that you guys kind of bonded over going there and a lot of uh, the ladies ended up hanging out together and stuff like that. So, so, so lovely um, to take this LA family from, you know, that you met through uh, the Parkinson scene to, to, and then travel to Kyoto with them. Oh. Um, th this time has flown by. It's been crazy. We have like uh, five, six minutes left, but I wanted to give each of you ladies maybe just a minute um, to maybe say something about, um, what as a woman with Parkinson's, um, you know, maybe it could be a word, it could be, you know, a, a sentence um, that you wish other people would understand uh, that is unique about being a woman um, with Parkinson's. I'll let you start, Naomi. I would say blessed because I wouldn't have had this community of, of wonderful people that I now have. That's so sweet. Sharon, do you want to go next? Me, Sharon? Um, yeah, that's hard to follow up, Naomi. Uh, fortunate um, to have met all these amazing people and fortunate that, I don't know if it's the medications or what it is, but it's given me the, uh, the strength to do these things, which I probably wouldn't have done 20 years ago. So thank you. Uh, Sharon, other Sharon? The word I would use is compassion. Um, compassion that I have had is, as, as people have offered to journey with me, that's given me compassion for myself and now compassion that I can offer back. So cool. And Susan? I want to give, and because all these are lovely, I want to give somebody else's wise words that they gave me when uh, soon after I was diagnosed and I was in a group of people who were, had a lot of severe uh, symptoms and he and he came up and he said you can't look around the room and ever see yourself because you don't know where medicine will be in five years or ten years and this is your Parkinson's not theirs and and I thought that has been a, something I've held on to uh, during this time and also the one thing about the mentor programs is we don't patronize each other we don't talk down to each other. We're very honest. And I think that's really important. That's it. I don't that's like the women I've met. I think they're all awful. <laughs> oh, um, so I think we can, we can actually write in the chat. We have a couple of minutes. We can have some other words be put in here if, if people want to type in what, what the, can their one. One more thing, because from Susan's story that she's given that story to me before, and one of the lines that I've taken from it is, don't look down the road too far, stay in the present, stay where you are now and enjoy that. 
And, and it's, 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 I think when you're diagnosed, you jump really far and you don't know where that's going to be. So that same story gave that to me from, from Susan. Yeah. I, I think that's I have, so a, I have a question for everybody out there and just show your hand. Um, when I was diagnosed and this was before I met Indu, you know, I was given no information and, you know, I was diagnosed 12 years ago. So it's changed a lot. There were two blogs that I could find and that was it in a few, a few organizations. How many of you, when you were diagnosed, were given information by your doctor? Just a handful, you know, about exercise, where to find and find stuff on the internet. You know, how many of you were told nothing? Well, I was given an empty notebook, so I don't know how that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I think, but I think that's, you know, here we are. It's 2021. And the internet, you know, there's so much stuff on the internet, good and bad, and yet women are still going in, and not just women, I mean, patients are still going in and seeing their doctors, getting a diagnosis, and given no information about Parkinson's and no direction to turn. So who do you find out from? Yeah. Other, peop other people who have Parkinson's is really the place to go to to say, hey, you're going to be okay. We, we're here to help you. And that's what we're all about. Yeah, that's really amazing and inspiring. And I think, you know, sometimes that visit when there's so much information given, I think, you know, I sometimes will just say, I'm going to give you this little, it'll be itty bitty piece of information today. And let's see you back in a couple of weeks once you've sort of, you know, process that and then we can kind of give you more counseling but it's it's a process so I think having people along the way and having different sorts of places to seek information and vet it and kind of have people who've kind of been that much farther along on the road can kind of guide you a lot and so I think you know all of these models of care um, are exciting to kind of consider and I think that you know with the internet and people being able to connect from Sweden to Trieste or wherever these people are all over the place, you know, it's, it's pretty magical. I mean, you kind of can be with anyone very quickly. And so I think, um, yeah. and get to know them pretty quickly and feel connected um, very quickly. So I think, I think I, I really admire all of you and, and I'm inspired by this. And I hope that we can, you know, talk more about how to kind of disseminate this model outside of just, you know, here um, throughout the world, not just for women, but, you know, thinking about all these different sorts of groups. And I think, you know, um, really think about how to kind of change the, the way forward for our Parkinson's patients. And there's a lot of positive comments here, um, you know, so, so much, so much great stuff out there. So I think, um, you know, really thank you so much for spending the time today. Um, maybe I will let uh, Sharon B, who's our new mentee, give us our last line of inspiration. I usually like to end with a line of inspiration, not to put you on the spot or anything like that. Oh, but. now you've terrified me. <laughs> I think, um, can I go back to what I was saying before yeah. about compassion? Because I believe that to define compassion, it means to journey with. And just spending this time journeying with all of you um, and, and hearing each other's voices, we're not alone. We're not alone. And um, let people in and reach out to others. Absolutely. Well, I think we're all, you know, through this loneliness research I've been doing, it's like, I just realized that, you know, connection, human connection is a basic human nutrient. It's basically like water and food. And I think we kind of have forgotten that so, so much, you know, in our society until recently, I think we, we've sort of really taken it for granted. So I think I agree. So let people in and what was it? And, and, and you let said people in and, and also then you can reach out that letting people, in, people lets in lets you reach out. I love that. That's amazing. Okay. 